heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Ed Ludlow. Good morning from San Francisco. Caroline Hyde's off today. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up on the program, full coverage of tech earnings as Amazon and Apple prepare to report this week. We'll discuss with Denny Fish of Janice Henderson. Plus, Walmart buying Tiger Global's Flipkart stake for $1.4 billion. We'll break down the company's big bet on the Indian retailer. And shares of SoFi surging today as the online bank raises revenue guidance. We'll look at the results with CEO Anthony Noto. Let's get a quick check on the markets. We're coming off a pretty big week on the Nasdaq 100, a very heavy tech index, but we're treading water to start the week, basically flat on both the Nasdaq 100 and Philadelphia Semiconductor Index. A lot of emphasis in the last week or so on good economic data. We're putting aside earnings recession fears and we're increasingly putting in place expectations for a softer landing. That is a question for Denny Fish. US 10-year yield back off four percentage points, but at 3.94%. And Bitcoin is traded in this narrow range at around 29,500 USD per token for the last seven days or so. It hasn't really had any catalyst in one direction or the other. We talked about that big earnings theme. These are the single names that we're watching in this program, Bloomberg Technology, SoFi, Big move to the upside, up 18% now, biggest jump in around a year on an intraday basis. We speak to the CEO, Antti Noto, halfway through the show. On semi, also giving a strong outlook for the third quarter. This is a maker of silicon carbide. We're going to dig into what that means for the EV space. Again, the CEO's on the show. You've got a question for either CEO, tweet me at Ed Ludlow. We want to know what your questions are. Later in the week, Amazon and Apple reporting on Thursday. So... We get to that discussion in a forward-looking sense with Janice Henderson in one second. Now, for this week's MLive Pulse survey, we asked investors if they intend to increase or decrease their exposure to tech stocks over the next six months. That's the question. The data shows many betting that the great tech rally of 2023 has staying power, but some appear skeptical that the artificial intelligence era will live up to the hype. Interesting. This is the numbers. We're going to break those down very shortly into the AI theme. Three to five years is the way you buy these. Yes. This is not going to be a short-term story. Tech is super expensive relative to the rest of the market. This trade is crowded. I think it's going to unravel. I look at this as a 1995 moment, biggest transformation that we've seen in tech in 30 years. There's a massive growth opportunity ahead of them. The AI creators and the beneficiaries seem to be centered in large cap tech, and that's where you have to go to take advantage of it. And I think that's why th this is just what's going to lead, obviously, despite Fed and macro. It's the start of a new tech bull market. Joining us now, Denny Fish, who manages the $4.3 billion Janice Henderson Global Technology and Innovation Fund. Same question to you, although your focus is pretty clear. Do you increase your exposure to certain corners of the tech market right now, or do you pull back? Well, definitely. I mean, I'm, my job running a sector fund is I'm always invested in technology. I'm so, business, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so clearly, you know, we move capital around based on where we feel the best opportunities are. Um, you know, and, you know, if we just look over the last week and just, you know, think about the earnings that we've seen and, you know, and, and some of the data points that are giving us some direction going forward, you know, the, you know, large tech names, you know, things have been pretty good so far. Uh, the digital advertising names, Meta and Alphabet, you know, things are starting to get better. Uh, the semiconductor complex, you know, for the most part, has actually been a little bit better than expectations. Uh, as we get through sort of the trough of, of the cycle and a, a lot of the parts of yes. that sector. Uh, and then, you know, generally speaking, software's been pretty good too. So, you know, all things considered, things have, things have been pretty good. Let's go back to last week. Is yeah. there a common thread between all of the names that reported that give you a kind of macro view of the tech sector right now? Yeah, yeah, it really does. So, as I mentioned, there are certain parts that are getting better, like digital advertising, which is good. Um, and then, you know, in, in semis, it's really been all about the, the areas that are really, really good. You talked about on semiconductor today. They reported this morning, uh, you know, exposure to auto has been great. Silicon carbide is one of the most, 
you know, significant themes within semis right now. Um, you know, and then clearly accelerated computing. If you just listen to the transcripts and the earnings calls from Microsoft, from Meta, from Alphabet, from others within the semi ecosystem, it's just accelerated computing, i.e., you know, GPUs and FPGAs. They're just sucking all the air out of the room right now. And so that's a really important theme. And then you know, something that maybe isn't as well noticed by the average investor within the silicon or, or the semiconductor supply chain, uh, because of this growth in accelerated computing, it's creating the need for different types of packaging as well. So there are a lot of, you know, interesting ways to actually play that. And then also, you know, talking about silicon carbide, for example, material science is having a bigger and bigger impact within the semiconductor supply chain as well. So those are really, really interesting areas because that's what enables EVs, the grid, like anything that's you know, power enabled. Go back to that idea on packaging really quick. Yep. We had the Intel CEO, Pat mm-hmm. Gelsinger, on with us Friday. It's kind of an area of their business that they don't talk about as much or perhaps we didn't ask. Yep. But we are trying to find out what happens when we get past the hype of NVIDIA and the H100s. Right. What's left for the rest? to come in, and, and, and you seem to suggest there are other opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we could go down to the most basic level. So if you even think about Intel, you know, they're now, you know, ramping up a foundry business, okay? The foundry, you, you can't produce GPUs without foundry, okay? And at the same time, uh, the foundry can't exist without semiconductor capital equipment. So, um, so that's really, really important. And these are all derivative plays. And then... Um, you can't actually design GPUs without electronic design automation software. And so these are all like really, really good sub-industries within, you know, this bigger, broader theme in ways that you can, that that should have multi-year tailwinds associated with it. The question always comes back to, okay, what, you know, what percentage of the business is actually being driven by AI or, or, you know, other things. And really, you know, they're the real direct plays like the NVIDIA's of the world, but then there are all these other different, you know, players within the ecosystem that also benefit as well. We had Jonathan Curtis of Franklin Templeton on the show last week, director of portfolio management, and he explained the reason he counts references to AI or artificial intelligence in the earnings transcripts is because it shows intention. Mm -hmm. It's evidence of a willingness to jump into that field. Do you put any value in that data set? Simply talking about AI. Well, well, everybody's talking about AI right now. So you, you really have to distill fact from fiction. But there are, you know, a really great conference call last week was the meta conference call. And it wasn't just talking about AI, but very, very specific ways in which the company is leveraging AI to actually improve its economics. And so it's everything from increasing uh, the, the effectiveness of ad targeting. So return on ad spend goes up for their customers. Uh, being able to auto-generate content, uh, which is really, really interesting, you know, is kind of the fundamental principle of generative AI. And then one of the things that they've wanted to do for years is monetize their messaging platforms more effectively with click to messaging. And now with AI and empowering that should enable them to actually monetize WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Instagram yes. messaging in a much more meaningful way than they have historically. Susan Lee, the Meta CFO, was on the program talking about how AI recommendations kind of played a role in that outlook for the current period yep. being strong. We have to think about this week, Amazon and Apple, yeah. two, two literal mega caps but mega names in the world of technology. What are you expecting or hoping to hear from them? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question, expect and hope. Um, <laughs> well, I, I think in Amazon's case, there, there's a wider range of outcomes, and the hope would be that we see a real nice inflection in North American retail profitability, because that's been the part of the business that has had a tougher time because of overbuilds and overhiring during the pandemic, having to digest their logistics investments. But we're starting to get through that, and so seeing progress there will be important. We had Prime Day, um, you know, which you know was clearly the best prime day ever and so should hear more about that and then amazon web services is obviously a big component of the valuation of the company we expect it to continue to decelerate but stable much in the same way that microsoft was and google was with their cloud computing platforms and then the hope there would be that as you know we're that we're getting through 
the optimizations that all of the cloud providers have talked about over the last couple of quarters, just given some of the macro headwinds. And then last but not least, uh, you know, advertising. It's a very significant uh, you know, part of the profitability equation for Amazon. And what we've seen out of Meta, what we've seen out of Alphabet, what we saw out of Roku late last week, the advertising market seems to be getting better. And so that, that, should, that should bode well for Amazon as well. So I think you mix all that up, um, you know, hoping for a, you know, a, a you know, better than expected report with key improvements in those three areas. Denny, of all the names you hold in your funds, which, from a technology perspective, impress you the most? Which is the innovator right now, big or small? Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's a good question. I would say if we think about the two companies that have probably been on their front foot more than any others as it relates to AI, clearly Microsoft. You know, It was very prescient of them to do the investment into open AI. They had a lot of investments across their portfolios well before people were even talking about it. You know, ChatGPT was the moment in, in November, but they were laying the tracks for, you know, how they're positioned uh, over the last several years. You know, clearly NVIDIA, I mean, you just, it's, it's the only, like, real 100% pure play on AI because they dominate the market for GPUs, and then, you know, they dominate um, accelerated computing, and, you know, and that's where all the capital's going. You know, it's interesting, if you actually dissect uh, CapEx, that we've heard, which is growing across all the major platforms, and look at you know the percentage that's going to accelerated computing and compute versus what's going to buildings. It's a, it's a material increase uh, for you know a company like Nvidia. So those would be two. Danny Fish yep. of Janice Henderson, such a broad knowledge base and a lot of companies in those funds. Thank you for your time. Now coming up, another name, Walmart, boosting its bets on India's Flipkart. We'll tell you more on the deal that will give the big box retailer a 77% stake in the company. We're also watching shares of Adobe. Morgan Stanley analyst Keith Weiss upgrading the stock and boosting its price target to a street high on optimism. Oh, you guessed it, in artificial intelligence. Weiss notes, that greater clarity on AI-enabled products and the monetization roadmap increases their confidence that in re-accelerating the creative cloud organic growth energy. That price target, 660, would mean the shares need to jump around 25% more in the next 12 months. But he sees that happening. This is Bloomberg Technology. Walmart is staking its claim in India's retail market, paying $1.4 billion to Tiger Global Management for its remaining stake in e-commerce company Flipkart. Reports say VC firm Excel also agreed to sell its 1% stake in Flipkart to Walmart. Joining us now with all the details, Bloomberg's Brendan Case, who covers Walmart, and Hema Palmer out of New York covering all things hedge funds. Okay, Brendan, let's start with you. What's the Walmart side of this story? Why go to boost the stake in Flipkart? I think from Walmart's standpoint, what this deal shows is the company's willingness to deepen its bet on India. Walmart's been pairing its international portfolio in recent years. It's gotten out of markets like the UK, Brazil, Japan. And if you look at what's left, the jewels in the crown are big, important businesses in Mexico and Canada, uh, an important business in China. And then India, where Flipkart is uh, one of the biggest e-commerce companies in the country. Hema, other side of the table, Tiger, why did they sell? Yes, yeah, so Tiger also been very keen on Indian investments. They were an early investor in Flipkart back in 2009, getting in at like a $42 million valuation. Um, what this deal lets them do is in this environment, when there are so fewer IPOs, it helps them provide distributions to their investors and provide a return to them. And they got a pretty good price for their exit, given how early they got in. Yeah, here on Bloomberg Technology, guys, I think we focus on India a lot, simply because there's so many people there. Right, Brendan, it's a big market opportunity. What's Walmart said about India and its potential for them? So from the perspective of Walmart executives in Arkansas, India is very, very meaningful. They first went into Flipkart in 2018. They, they, they bought a majority stake for $16 billion. That's actually Walmart's biggest ever acquisition. 
Uh, and now they've got Flipkart going toe to toe uh, with Amazon and other companies in, in India. The other part of it is PhonePay, which is a digital payments company, which used to be part of Flipkart. The two separated in December. And Walmart's got really high hopes for both companies. It's talked about the potential for an initial public offering. Timing remains murky, but that's definitely something that could move the needle for the parent company as a whole. You know, Hema, you outlined the reasons why Tiger got out of this investment, right? But give me some of the history. Why did they first get in, and, and has it been a success for them? Yeah, so they had been an early investor in a number of Asia, uh, Asian companies. Um, they got into Flipkart in 2009. They built up a stake of a billion dollars over the years. Um, in the past five, six years, they sold some of their stake, um, and this is the final exit for them. But what this means for investors in the fund is investors are getting a $3.5 billion return. Um, that's the gain on that basically $1 billion investment. So it's a pretty good exit. You know, keep in mind that the valuation of Flipkart is uh, the deal was valued lower than the last round, um, but not not terribly lower. You know, they, the last round was about $38 billion, um, the valuation of Flipkart, and this deal was done at a valuation of about 35. It's an interesting play on the e-commerce side, Brendan. It kind of fits in with the Walmart we know. But you and I spent a bit of time out in Arkansas looking under the hood, pardon the pun, of what else Walmart's investing in on the tech side. Where, do, where does Flipkart fit in, in within the broader tech strategy for Walmart? Certainly Flipkart and PhonePay are a big piece of the puzzle. I think it's fair to say that Walmart has learned a lot from those companies uh, and will probably can continue to learn more from those companies. If you shift the focus back to the U.S., you're still talking about a big focus on e-commerce. And in terms of an investment, the way that's kind of manifesting itself right now is in a, sort of a rethinking, kind of an overhaul of a lot of distribution centers and a lot of stores, uh, basically boosting the bet on automation robotics and trying to just become more efficient in terms of fulfilling the online demand that they have. All right, team reporting. Thanks to Bloomberg's Hemma Barmer out of New York, Brendan Case out of Dallas, Mr. Big Box, we call him Mr. Walmart. In other retail news, Amazon says it's pushing to make speed delivery a priority. The online retail giant plans to double the number of U.S. same-day delivery centers in, quote, the coming years, though it didn't disclose how many same-day warehouses it currently has. Most same-day facilities are smaller and closer to major population centers across the U.S. Amazon's quarterly results, as we've been saying, come out this Thursday. Now, coming up, President Biden planning to sign an executive order to limit U.S. tech investments in China. What this means for AI and chips next. This is Bloomberg. Time for Talking Tech. First up, Disney and NBC are paying lobbyists to watch over legislation that would bar them from using AI as a state tax break. The New York bill comes as both companies battle Hollywood writer and actor strikes over the future use of AI displacing workers in film and TV productions. Plus, Curve Finance, a native token of one of crypto's top decentralized exchanges, tumbled after the platform said it had been hacked. A glitch in programming language Viper, which is widely used in DeFi apps, led to estimated losses ranging from 20 to 40 million US dollars. And US and European officials are growing increasingly concerned by China's rush into the production of legacy chips. President Biden limited controls over China's ability to secure these advanced chips that power AI models. But Beijing's responded by pouring billions of dollars into factories for the so-called legacy chips that are not banned and are still essential to the global economy. Let's stick with the story and bring in Bloomberg's Katie Lyons out of D.C. The concerns are clear. The question is, what are they going to do about it? 
Yeah, and it's a really tough question, Ed, because they want to tread semi-lightly with China here. They are trying to be very targeted, narrow, specific in the restrictions they put into place so as not to escalate in dramatic fashion this trade war in tit-for-tat that is going on between the largest economies. Hence why the Biden administration specifically focused on this advanced chip-making technology. They didn't really touch anything bigger than 14 nanometers. So that leaves legacy chips as essentially fair game for China, typically those 28 nanometers uh, and wider. And that is really what they're ramping up here. Yes, that technology is more than a decade old, but as you allude to, Ed, it is still very critical in terms of things like smartphones and EVs. It is the shortages of legacy chips that were such a problem in the pandemic era when chip shortages wiped billions of dollars uh, off of companies' ability to sell things uh, like cars, for example. So this is highly critical, and the concern here is that if China can dominate that market, flood the market essentially with these legacy chips, that even Western companies are going to be dependent on China for them. That gives Beijing more leverage. So the U.S. and Europe are looking into, we understand, uh, how they could potentially rein China back here. But again, they don't want to cast too wide a net for fear of the retaliation that could bring from Beijing. Well, that's exactly my point, that you're in D.C. This seems to be a worrying story at a time where the main actors in D.C. are, are trying to get us on a friendlier footing with China. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a difficult tightrope that the Biden administration in particular is trying to walk at, as you do have administration officials like Secretary of State Antony Blinken or Treasury Secretary Jen Yellen actually making the trip to China to try and reestablish communication with their counterparts at the same time that you have this tit-for-tat back and forth on trade measures. And that's why when we're looking forward to things like what we understand could be an executive order on outbound investment into China in just a couple weeks in mid-August, they are trying to keep it very narrow, very specific. We understand that executive order will focus on things like semiconductors, AI, and quantum computing. They aren't trying to put a, a wide cast on, uh, on outbound investment into China. Just keep it focused on what would protect U.S. national security interests and not ch harm China too greatly economically, because the line continually out of the administration uh, is that this isn't about to do damage to the China economy. It is only about protecting national security inf interests and really just de-risking rather than decoupling with China. But it's a very uh, difficult equation for these officials, Ed. And it's another example of the US and EU being aligned mm -hmm. in this particular issue over China. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons out of DC. Thank you. We are going to talk more about chips later in the program. But coming up, SoFi shares surging today. We're going to discuss why with the CEO of the company, Anthony Nodo. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Technology. Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. A quick check on the markets. NASDAQ 100 is just treading water. We're almost flat this Monday. Big earnings to come this week. We are coming off a bit of a rally, the NASDAQ 100. We talk about it because there's so many tech names on that index. There will be a rebalancing, but we're coming off a 2% weekly gain last week. Now, if there is one single name that we're watching, it is SoFi. Biggest jump on an inch day basis in a year, up more than 18% now raising its full year revenue guidance, adding members in the quarter just gone. There's a lot of momentum in this stock and in this company. Let's get more on the company's earnings and bring in SoFi CEO, Anthony Noto. Anthony, welcome to Bloomberg Technology and thank you for your time. I, I want to understand something better. The 584,000 members that you added in the quarter just gone, what does that mean? Are they depositors? What, what kind of services are they using? Sure. The uh, members are someone that has a product with us. So uh, in the quarter, we added 584,000 members, up 44%. Um, the two largest pieces of that were SoFi Money, which is a checking savings account. You get 4.4% interest on savings if you do direct deposit with us. Uh, you can spend any time, anywhere you want, no restrictions, no fees. And we also, um, because we're treating you as a member, you get access to all our member benefits, reward programs, 
programs as well as a free certified financial planner. In addition to that, we offer a credit card that would be in that number. Um, in addition to that, we also offer brokerage so you can buy single stocks uh, without commissions, ETFs. We have six robo accounts and then we offer cryptocurrency and we most recently did an IPO, uh, oddity IPO. So um, in addition to four different types of loans, uh, we have those products uh, that we I just mentioned. And then we also have a technology platform revenue segment. On the depositor and deposit side, is this as simple as you taking business from the regional banks that suffered in the first half of this year? We're taking business, but it's not from the regional banks. It's from the largest banks in the country, the top five banks uh, in the country by deposit accounts or checking savings accounts. That's where we're getting the bulk of our market share from. We've positioned SoFi over the last five and a half years to be a one-stop shop for all your financial services needs. So we give you all the products that you need on a daily basis, but then we're also there for the big uh, decisions you have to make financially, like buying a home, paying for college education, starting to invest for retirement. And so it's the everyday products and then those larger products. Many of the large banks have abandoned unsecured personal loans or have walked away from home loans. Um, our goal is to put the member at the center of what we're doing. And we have to be there for everything they do and have that lifetime relationship in order to help them get their money right to reach the point they have enough of it to do what they want, whether that's owning a home, retiring at a certain age, whatever career they may want to have or size family. Anthony, the stock's up more than 18 percent, biggest jump in a year. What do you make of that reaction? You know, the team has been working incredibly hard over the last five and a half years to build out this complete suite of products. And for the first time, 50% um, of our growth on a year year basis came from non lending products. And that was the lending products were the first products that we've had. Everything else has been introduced uh, since then. So 50% of our year year revenue growth came from our financial services segment and our technology platform segment. So it's the first time we can truly say that our strategy of being a one-stop shop is now playing out in the actual financial results on the revenue side. On the profit side, we had our fourth consecutive quarter of um, record EBITDA, but most importantly, we're on track for gap profitability by the fourth quarter with the one segment of our three that is still losing money, uh, but it only lost $4 million in the quarter on a contribution profit basis. And that improved from a loss of $24 million in Q1 of this year and $44 million in Q4 of last year. And so this segment should become profitable by the end of the year, reinforcing uh, the fact that not only are we giving the consumer a great, uh, complete one-stop shop, but our financial results also reflect the completeness of that diversification. You had a goal of 30% return on equity. That's double JP Morgan. Is that still in sight, that goal? Yes, absolutely. We believe we'll have 30% EBITDA large margins long term and 20% gap net income margins long term. And that should position us to have that 30% or higher ROE. The mix of businesses that we have, it's not just the financial services products, um, but it's also a technology platform business where we enable um, processing of payments, debit and ACH payments, as well as banking in a box uh, for other providers, including B2B. And we have uh, over 125 million accounts in that segment that are generating over $8 billion of transactions a year that we get paid for. So we have a mix that's much more like American Express than a traditional bank in that we have both this large technology business in addition to these high ROE products like credit card uh, as well as invest products. Anthony, so far has been very close to the student loan story. And since last we spoke, we've had some kind of clarity from the regulatory side. I just wondered if you could update us on kind of what opportunity you're now seeing in student loans for the company. Yes, the sort of student loan refinancing business this quarter was still relatively depressed as it has been for the last three years while the moratorium on paying federal student loans was in place. For those who are not familiar, we take federal student loans and help um, our members refinance them at a lower rate. Um, or extending the terms so they have a lower monthly payment, even if it's at the same or, or higher rate. That business was our largest and most profitable through Q4 of 2019. And then when the moratorium got put in place, which was necessary given the pandemic and the crisis we were under, um, the business went to be very, very small, about a quarter of what it used to be. So we anticipate that that will come back more strongly in 2024. Um, there will start to be a pickup in Q3 and more in Q4. Um, but our outlook for it has not changed since the beginning of the year, which was an expectation 
that the federal payments would resume come September, October time period, which is what will happen. Now, there's 40 million people in the United States that still have a federal student loan, and a portion of those people can refinance with SoFi. To date, in a company's history, we haven't even financed more than 1 million student loan uh, refinancing members. So there's a large opportunity still ahead of us, but one that's not reflected in today's results, nor do the, does our improved outlook reflect any greater expectation than before. Uh, Anthony, before we lose you, I want you to recall your days at Twitter. The idea of an everything app, going from a social media platform, adding banking, adding in other financial services. Do you think that that's a reality for X to become an, a platform like that? Yeah. <clears throat> when I joined the company in early 2018, five and a half years ago, every fin fintech company said they want to be a one-stop shop. Five and a half years later, only SoFi has done it. In addition to those competitors not being able to accomplish what we have, look at the incumbents. They still haven't been able to put all of their products on a digital platform and be a one-stop shop. It's not easy to do. It's an incredibly large investment. We've been deficit funding it for five and a half years. So it's a pretty tall mountain to climb. We kind of feel like we've climbed that mountain and we're on the other side. And uh, we wish everyone luck trying to get over it. Um, hopefully it will be good for the industry and the more reliable fintech companies can be, the more trusted they can be, we think we'll benefit from that. I think it's a tall, tall task to go after, <clears throat> but one we've done successfully. So I wish other people luck. A tall, tall path to go after. Can Elon Musk do it based on his experience with PayPal and, and his career so far? We, we take everyone seriously. Anyone that wants to compete in the industry, whether it's in a single product or across the entire platform, um, there's a lot of competition and we're no stranger to seeing that. We have uh, companies that are 100 times bigger than us that we're competing with and we've been able to do quite well and I'm confident that will be the case. Um, I don't think anyone has bigger aspirations than we have at SoFi. And as a leader, I'm responsible for making sure we deliver on that every second of every hour of every day. All right. SoFi shares up more than 18 percent, raising net revenue guidance to 1.97 billion to 2.03 billion for 2023. Thank you for your time. SoFi CEO Thank Anthony you, Noto. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, it. coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, Hassan Al Khoury on Semi CEO, going to join to discuss the semiconductor device company's second quarter results and an update on silicon carbide. This is Bloomberg Technology. SpaceX sent the largest commercial communication satellite ever into orbit this weekend. The payload was on top of its Falcon Heavy, taking off from the launch pad at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The Jupiter 3 satellite weighs nine metric tons and is the size of a bus. It's going to provide wireless internet over North and South America, operated by Hughes Network Systems. Let's talk chips. Shares of OnSem are up after making the most of power and image sensing chip sales, giving an outlook for the third quarter above expectations. It was also a record quarter for automotive revenues and silicon carbide revenues grew four times year over year. For more, Hassan al Khoury on Semi CEO here with us. Hassan, thank you so much for your time. Look, the, the third quarter outlook above expectations, what gave you the confidence there? What are the factors behind that? Yeah, look, two years ago, we have uh, uh, doubled down on uh, automotive and industrial, but more importantly, on the technology of uh, uh, power and sensing. Those are the technologies that are driving all of the mega trends you talk about as far as electrification of the vehicle, but also the infrastructure necessary to support that electrification, like the renewable energy, energy generation, uh, and energy distribution in the form of uh, charger or fast chargers. That business has been ranking for us, and that's what uh, is going to provide that growth in the third quarter, which also provided that uh, growth in the second quarter. You know, I was reading the, the, the transcript from the earnings call, and the word secular comes up, right? This is a secular demand story. So what happens when the tra technology transitions happened? 
how do you maintain momentum when there is secular demand? Uh, first, you have to pre-invest. You know, we've been investing in, uh, in our silicon carbide specifically, but also image sensing for autonomous driving. Uh, we've been investing over the last two years when we uh, started our transformation. Uh, we talked about these trends at, as being the, the trends for us for the future that are going to support that growth above the semiconductor market growth. Uh, we reiterated that view in our analyst day uh, a few months ago. And now that has uh, uh, started delivering. And you can see the penetration of EVs from a total uh, vehicles made has been increasing quarter on quarter, year over year, only to reach maybe 50% by 2030. So this is a multi-decade long uh, uh, mega trend that we're participating in. There are some OEMs, I think Tesla actually has discussed this, about wanting to reduce their exposure to silicon carbide due to the expense how do you manage that mindset among the end customer? Uh, it's actually a very uh, a good opportunity for us. Uh, we're in a very good position. We provide both silicon and silicon carbide power. You know, you've heard me talk about hybrid uh, uh, module uh, capability, where a single module, we are able to put silicon carbide and silicon power in order to give the most optimal solution for a customer uh, system need. Uh, we've had that. We're in production with it in industrial. We're going to production in automotive. So it literally plays very well into how we also see the market. So one thing I would note, the reduction of silicon carbide is not on a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle basis. It's a different platform. You know, if you want ultra-high performance, long range, silicon carbide is it. If you're talking about city driving, where you're going to charge it maybe every uh, evening, short run, of course, uh, IGBT is, uh, uh, can, can do the job. And if you want something in between, that's where IGBT and silicon carbide comes in. Again, our focus, we only win when our customer wins. And that's the most optimal solution, whether it's silicon or silicon carbide. We're able to support both. And that's the uh, strategy we have. You know, Hassan, you, you, on semi was into silicon carbide early. You know, the, the advantages from a energy efficiency standpoint, but I, I see some of your competitors kind of coming around silicon carbide. They have scale. So how do you stay competitive without the same sort of scale that some of the competition has? Well, compared to any of the competition, we either have more scale or we're at scale. You know, scale is not an issue because if you look at some of, the, uh, some of our peers or competitors that uh, you're describing, uh, they've had issues either ramping at the pace we have done it or they're not vertically integrated, meaning they still dependent on uh, material or sourcing material from third parties or merchant market, which adds to uh, the risk in uh, uh, the supply resiliency or supply assurance we have to give our customers. Where, I, where we are, uh, on top of the technology innovation, we're able to give our customers supply assurance through a supply resilient network. Uh, we've proven that, we've proven that in the ramp, you know, going 4X, uh, year over year is not something you just stumble upon. It's something you keep executing to every day. Uh, we've proven our execution and we're going to continue delivering. And that adds the confidence that our customers have. And you've seen that confidence translate into long-term supply agreements uh, that have reached a record this quarter as well. Hassan, I've reported on some, some tier ones that have come into the space. For example, Bosch buying TSI, a small Northern Californian Silicon Carbide name. Is further M&A for you guys something that's on the table or is it just not necessary? Uh, I would say M&A is not necessary for us to achieve what we need to uh, achieve. You know, everything we've outlined uh, at uh, our uh, analyst day, uh, we're able to achieve organically through execution and the market uh, drivers are there for us to, uh, to grow with. However, we always look and we use M&A. And we use that as complementary. You know, if we can able to get uh, an M&A asset to accelerate something we are doing or make it even better and faster or be better use of capital uh, rather than us investing in it, we're absolutely going to do it. You know, about 18 months ago, uh, we acquired GTAC, which is a substrate uh, manufacturing company. And that gave us the capability and we applied our ability to scale. And from the time we acquired it, meaning a 14-month period, we 5x that capacity. So we'll use our uh, benefit as our scale and our capabilities 
and we'll use MA as a complementary aspect. But there's nothing I would sit here and say we are missing something to achieve our uh, our goals or our long term uh, uh, financial uh, target. But we will use MA if yes. we can accelerate it better. Um, Hassan, in China, they've been domesticating their supply for silicon carbide, kind of hand in hand with the, the broader EV supply chain there. Does China still represent an opportunity for you? Uh, China is an opportunity uh, for us. You know, we've had engagement. We've always said uh, our uh, revenue and our exposure uh, overall is geographically distributed and more importantly is customer diverse. Uh, so we don't have a, a region that we have uh, additional focus on versus other. So that makes us very comfortable to be able to manage the, uh, the supply and the demand side of it. That's one. As far as silicon carbide specifically uh, in China, the focus today in China is really on uh, the substrate manufacturing. So from a device and module capability, we are far ahead. We're a few generations ahead. Uh, that's why uh, a lot of marquee names in China have LTSAs, multi-year LTSAs with on semi. That's proof that uh, we're able to provide what somebody local cannot. Of course, the only way you can do that whether it's China or Europe or North America, you have to keep innovating. That's how you remain ahead, regardless of what we do. All right. Our thanks to Hassan El Khoury on Semi CEO talking everything Silicon Carbide. Coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, guess who's back on Twitter? I mean, X after a nearly eight month suspension. We'll have the details on Yi's return to the social media platform. This is Bloomberg. Ye, the artist formerly known as Kanye West, has been reinstated on X, the social media platform formerly known as Twitter. This comes following a nearly eight-month suspension for breaching a company rule against inciting violence. X told the Wall Street Journal that the account won't be eligible for monetization, nor will advertisements appear next to posts. Ye has yet to post on the platform. Neither Ye nor X responded to Bloomberg's requests for comment. All right, this is the other top, top story on Bloomberg.com and the terminal. Apple is just weeks away from introducing the iPhone 15 and next generation watches. New lineup marks another stepping stone towards the company's dream iPhone. Though changes to the Apple Watch, they're going to be modest. Here with all the details, who else? Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. I learned a new word today, bezel. What's that? <laughs> a bezel is uh, basically the smartphone term for the border uh, around the screen. And so for this year... The big visual change on the iPhone 15 Pro, at least from the front, will be that those borders are going to get about a third thinner. Now, that might not seem like a lot, but the technology behind it, funny enough, is inside Apple. It's called LiPo, uh, L-I-P-O, and it's basically a special manufacturing technology that allows them to get the screen closer to the borders, closer to the edges, and so it's a big visual improvement. Uh, someday in the future, Apple wants to have a borderless phone with no buttons, no camera cutouts in the front. And so, of course, this is another uh, step towards that. In the power on, I encourage the audience to go and read the latest power on. It has those new details about what we expect. But you, you, you're kind of more downbeat about upgrades to the watch. Why are they going to be modest? So last year was a pretty significant update for the Apple Watch. You had the Apple Watch Ultra. Uh, which is the first all-new Apple Watch design. Uh, that was the first all-new Apple Watch design in four years, right? So quite a bit of time. You had a redesigned I, uh, Apple Watch SE, which is the entry-level Apple Watch. And then you had a pretty minor update to the main Apple Watch with the Series 8. But nonetheless, you had three new models, right? And so you can't really do three new models, including two new designs in one year, and then the next year expect anything major, right? So this year is pretty moderate. You're going to see a new Apple Watch Series 9. That's the standard Apple Watch. And then you're going to see a second generation Apple Watch uh, Ultra. I would expect some new colors, but faster processors is going to be the talk in addition to the new Watch OS 10 of the models for this fall. All right, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. Check out his latest power on on Bloomberg.com. That does it, I'm afraid, for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. So much to recap. Busy start to the week. We have our podcast wherever you get yours on the Bloomberg platforms, as well as Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and as I said, Bloomberg.com. From here in San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology.